You're listening to the Really Useful Podcast. This is the podcast for technophobes from makeusoft.com. Welcome to the show. My name is Christian Corley and with me this week is Gavin Phillips. How are you doing, Gavin? Doing very well, Christian. Uh, looking forward to getting stuck into my first recording of the year with you. That's very nice of you to say so. Uh, now, over the past few weeks, you may have noticed in the news, dear listener, uh, references to KES, or CES, as it's actually referred to. Uh, this is an event that takes place every year, most years, and it's basically about uh, consumer electronics. That's where it gets its name from, uh, although it's not really referred to that anymore. Um, now, I've never been... You might be a bit vague about it. I can't explain much about it to you, really. I mean, I mean, I could tell you that the Commodore 64 was first unveiled at the uh, the event in 1982 and things like that. But, I mean, generally speaking, my knowledge of the event is pretty minimal. But it's just as well that Gavin went. Well, hey, I'm back <laughs> hey. from Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, in this week's show, we're basically answering the questions, what is CES, why do people go there, what the fuss is about, what products are shown there, and how many of them actually make it to Marketplace after being previewed there. So, Gavin, first of all, um, what is CES? Uh, well, as you said, Christian, it's the, it's the consumer electronics show, um, and it is the, it's the biggest tech event of the year. It kicks off every single year and it's where a lot of the biggest names in tech take their biggest and shiniest and newest bits of tech to show off to the world so you'll typically have say the big names like samsung uh, tcl lg microsoft uh, and so on and so on will all be there showing what they've been working on and often keeping under wraps for the past sort of 12 months or, or even longer, depending on, on the tech. Um, the whole idea of it is that it brings all of the focus of the world onto this single event. And anybody who's anybody can showcase exactly what they've been working on. And because of the amount of press um, and the amount of people that are there, it typically garners you know, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of articles, uh, countless hours on YouTube. Um, and if you are going to, if you were going to launch something and you really wanted to make a splash, CES is probably the place you would want to do it. Okay, so it's a really big event, isn't it? Yeah, the, the scale of it, um, as like, so this is the first time I've ever been to CES and people often say it is huge. Uh, but it's not really until you go there, you fully understand quite how colossally huge it is so uh, there were this year I believe 3,200 odd exhibitors wow. um, showcasing over uh, I don't know how many square foot it was but it takes up the entirety of the Las Vegas Convention Center which uh, in itself is is a phenomenally large building and then it spreads out into Another hotel there called the Venetian, uh, where it also has a massive show floor spread over four different halls. Uh, and then there are also sort of um, other events hosted at other hotels up and down the Las Vegas Strip. So the PR wow. conferences are held in another place at one end of it. And then uh, many of the exhibitors um, buy... Uh, hotel suites to showcase their products on a more personal level so you might see something on the show floor that looks interesting uh, but it's difficult to get a good idea of, of how it is or, or, or what it looks like or if say if it was headphones you know you can't really hear how they sound properly um, but you might be able to go to a separate private suite and hear how they work or or to get a private demonstration of or something like that Wow. Uh, as a sense of scale, dear, dear listener, the Las Vegas Convention Center is 2.5 million square feet. Yes, and it certainly feels like that when you're walking around it. <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, obviously with, with any convention of that size, everything is 
split up into relevant areas. So this year, for the first time, um, electric vehicles um, had sort of their own hall all to themselves. Previously, right. um, from what I was made to understand, is that they were, you know, they had areas within halls that were relating to the tech, but because of the boom in electric vehicle technology, they had an enormous hall all to themselves. Um, and that would take you nearly 20 to 25 minutes to walk from one side to the other. And that was just one hall filled entirely with EV technology. Right, and the time right. it takes to, yeah, to like look at each um, different exhibitor. Uh, sort of, you, I mean, you can't really look at each individual exhibitor, which is kind of the the shame of the event is that it's so big you can never hope to see absolutely everything um so you do have to plan your routes uh plan your routes carefully oh and this is actually quite interesting and i've never seen this before is that uh some people hire um ces guides so you go to a booth within the hall and you say oh i want to see these sorts of technologies and they say oh you should join up with this ces tour oh. and uh, like you would see say on the streets of london or paris or whatever you know someone holding up a clipboard and you know follow me now we're going off to this booth and, uh, and all that sort of stuff so it's very interesting wow wow so um you obviously saw a lot of things there and um it's, it's going to be very difficult to pin you down on anything specifically but I will try and do that in a bit. But first of all, what do you think was what 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 area, what section of consumer technology was the biggest draw? Uh, I think from what I particularly noticed was that um, smart health was okay. really everywhere. Um, there were a lot of people talking about integrations with you know, well, smart home integrations, but also leading into smart health integrations and how we can bring, you know, healthcare analysis into our homes and into our lives and make it easier to use. So one of the products that caused a bit of a stir at uh, CES 2023 was the Withings or Withings you scan uh, which uh, is a small device um, a smart device that you put into your toilet <laughs> nice and uh, it analyzes uh, analyzes uh, your urine um, every oh, time okay. you go for a wee basically and tells you if you're you know basically up to health you know um, now some people have already pulled this apart for its privacy issues because um, why things have been a bit sketchy about how your data has been held. But that was a prime example of bringing smart health into the home and making it easier because people are wanting to know more about what their body is doing at all times these days. You know, like with the advent of um, like smart watches telling us what's going on with our heart rates and all that sort of stuff. And even earbuds telling you, you know, is, is your heart beating properly and all this sort of stuff. So these sorts of products are like the next evolution of that. Right. I'm looking at this with some doubt, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, cartridges are capable of informing you when you're ovulating, testing your vitamin levels, assessing hydration levels, and providing insight into your general level of nutrition, which sounds good. Um, it also says um, separately that urinalysis is used in clinics to measure various compounds that pass through your urine and is commonly used to diagnose urinary tract infections. Um, as the father of a child with kidney issues, I can tell you how difficult it is to diagnose urinary tract infections reliably. So I'm already thinking, I don't think that's going to work very well. I can't see it. Yeah. Taking off. Absolutely. And I think that's what some people were sort of saying is um, whilst this sounds like a good product, perhaps for those uh, who are leading a normal uh, life of health, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, for those who may want to try and rely on this to see for deeper analysis into existing healthcare issues is probably maybe promising a little bit too much. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think with a lot of the smart health stuff that I saw, I think you have to take a, it with a pinch of salt on the analysis that it can actually give you because yeah. uh, outside of, you know, like uh, lab conditions, it's never going to be 
entirely accurate in the same way that if you gave a sample to a doctor or a nurse and they analysed it for specific things. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? Because you have something a tool like this, and I, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with it, and I like the idea, but these sort of um, observations that it takes from you, all that is going to then happen in most places, I'm not going to say in every place, but in sort of in most places with a healthcare system, the same tests are then going to be repeated in a healthcare setting, aren't they? So it, it, it's what is it doing really other than, I mean, is it adding, I mean, you could say, well, it's giving me a warning or whatever, but at the same time, is it causing, is it causing anxiety? If it uh, comes up with something that's a bit concerning, and then you know, you're waiting for a doctor's appointment or whatever, getting test results and things. So I'm, um, it's good, and I think there's, there is obviously going to be that point in the future where healthcare settings and providers are able to work with the, the, the providers of technology like this. But we're, we're, we're not at that stage yet, are we? So you're going to have this sort of duplication. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. yeah, for sure. And I guess these are the products that we're seeing now that are you know testing that water and will start to bridge those gaps. But... When they come with, I can't remember how much the subscription for it was. <laughs> oh, sorry. Testing the water, Gavin. <laughs> you didn't even realise, did you? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, I, I was drinking a cup of tea when you said it. Uh. <laughs> um, so the other big thing uh, we saw quite a lot of was there was some sort of metaverse stuff as you'd expect metaverse yeah. integrations for me metaverse is very much hit and miss still but it was interesting to see that companies were still very much pursuing it yeah. uh, and companies were trying to basically just illustrate how their unique product is going to help you in your new metaverse life and as we've talked about before on this podcast we're relatively uncertain about the the benefits of uh, at least what people are currently touting as the metaverse and how that's going to actually be beneficial yeah and from what i saw at ces there wasn't a great deal of difference to what people were saying i'm looking through a list of uh our collection of nine weird and wacky products seen at CES 2023. We've, uh, it's got the U-Scan on there. Uh, it's got the GateTech Smart insoles. Fancy those myself, actually. The Bird Buddy Smart Bird Feeder, which, to be honest with you, I think that's the best item on the list. The colour change in BMW iX, which just seems frivolous. The Rolkers Personal Mobility Device, again. The No Watch Wellbeing Tracker. The zero distance we head device, which I don't even understand what that is. L'Oreal's Brow Magic and the Block Smart Cutting Board. Now, looking at these, uh, the, the idea of the uh, smart insoles is quite useful. But looking at this, I'm not really seeing anything. I mean, they're weird and wacky. They also seem largely, apart from the bird feeder, I can't see any of them really taking off. I like the idea of a smart bird feeder, though. I would love a smart bird feeder. I can't get the birds to come to my bird feeder. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get any birds in my uh, my yard. I would uh, maybe it's too close to the house, but I digress. Uh, I think it depends sort of what you go to CES for. Really, there's uh, there's so much to see, and I, like half of the stuff on the list you've just referenced there, Christian. Uh, I I didn't even see it. Didn't even know. Well, it okay, then. well let's turn that around. What did you see that you thought was absolutely crackers? Absolutely crackers. I went into a, I walked into this, it's like a, a holographic dome, basically, which I oh. really enjoyed. And you walk into it and in, because it's a holographic dome, once you walk inside it, it's like a 270 degrees or slightly more. And once you walk through the entrance to it, it, it immerses you in an entire circle because it's a hologram. And then on the screen you hold your hands up and you can move it's like more like a particle simulator i really really enjoyed that okay um but across the entire floor there was the the flying car i'm not sure if we've what? talked about the flying car no yet. we haven't talked about the flying car <laughs> so we didn't actually get to see it flying which was a shame oh. so it was more like a, a fully functional prototype which 
uh, they were kind of like we're we're not going to be able to get this fully going. But it, when it was outside the CES buildings, it was the uh, oh, what's the name of it? The Aska Aska Five or something like that. Aska A Five. Uh, that's A S K A. Uh, and it's it's a bit like. It's a bit like you imagine. It's like a car with with wings, but it looks slightly more so dynamic. an aeroplane. Yeah, it's like a cross between two, but the wings uh, were foldable, and it can launch right. vertically, and it has a range of two hundred and fifty miles. So, like once you land, like the wings can fold back in, so that you could drive along a road like normal. Um, so okay. that was that was quite unique and interesting. All right, I'm looking um, at some pictures of that. It does look a little bit more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, more convincing as a uh, flying car than some that I've seen. Yeah, but then some of the stuff you see like doesn't have to be necessarily the wacky and the wild. It was more stuff that y you will probably see within the, the next few years. So Samsung were at CES 2023 and they were showing off a lot of stuff, lots of TV tech and what have you. But one of the most interesting things they had there was its... Um, flex hybrid tablet and so we've already had you know foldable screens and so this flex hybrid device you fold it open like you've seen with a foldable smartphone but then you can pull the side of the screen to expand the screen to give yourself more screen room so it's sort of like an area of the screen tucked away um, so it expands from, so say you fold it out and it's a, a 10 inch tablet, you pull the edge of the screen open further and it expands into a 12 inch tablet and gives yourself a little bit more room. Um, <clears throat> and that's um, part of their foldable and uh, bendable screen technology. So you can actually okay. bend the screens into different positions and make them, you know, how you want them to look. That does sound actually quite balmy, actually. Well, that's it. But like, so although that sounds like wild, that's the sort of tech that will probably be coming within the next few years once it's been tested more rigorously. Yeah. Whilst the flying plane is, you know, jolly exciting and interesting, you're still very unlikely to see a flying plane landing on your high street <laughs> anytime soon. Well, no one's a flying plane landing on the <clears throat> high street. I think we've got we've got perception with certain things. Okay. So and and they have to work in the way that we perceive them to work. So as long as in my in my view, as long as a flying car has wings, it's not going to take off. <laughs> hey, pun. It's, it's the, <laughs> Lots of puns today. When a flying car looks like something from the Jetsons or Back to the Future, that's when they'll take off, I think. That's when they'll be accepted in the you know, public consciousness as a flying vehicle. Get rid of the wings, basically, is what I'm saying. And uh, that's, that's when people will be thinking, ah, flying car, not funny-looking aeroplane. Yeah, and uh, I guess in the future that's what we will have but as uh people at the show were saying and as i agree with people on the road are bad enough at driving on the normal road let alone well, ex well by indeed. adding a whole another dimension <laughs> indeed yes yes and then there's parking as well <clears throat> yeah How do you, do you park just tether it to the top of the building well exactly uh, yeah do you, do you park it in the floor if you're parking it in a car park you i mean it's quite a sizable thing so you're going to be taking like two back-to-back -back spaces up i'm a bit of a bugger when it comes to parking because I drive an MPV, and I found in the early years of driving an MPV, I say the early years, it took quite some time to reinforce, actually, how bad other people are at parking, and what idiots they can be when it's a bit windy. So I've, if I can't get a parent and child sort of extra space car park, you know, where there's the extra space around the doors, I will take up a car parking space right up to the line so no one parks next to me. And I know that's yeah. bad, but... I'm, People will let their cars bash open in the wind, bash the doors open into the wind, and then they won't, you know, they'll damage your car, and they won't leave any insurance details. So, it's just, you know, it's a step you have to take. Anyway, I, dig I digress. Uh, laptops. 
are that area of computing that are uh, still doing all right, aren't they? And there's some new laptops released or announced at CES. Oh, yeah. So, like, my favourite one, like, by far, and this blew me away, was the uh, Lenovo YogaBook 9i. Uh, I thought, I I, this... do you know what? I knew you were going to say that. After what you just said yeah. about all those stretchy screens, I thought he's going to really have liked that yoga book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this the, this was at the top of our um, CES new laptops list as well, and for a very good reason. Like I just I really loved the concept of this. I mean, it looks a little bit silly when the screen hinges on top of itself, and you definitely probably wouldn't rock that in a uh, in a coffee shop. But the beauty of it is. Um, sorry, I should explain first. It's a dual screen laptop where instead of having a um, to like a giant 15 or 17 inch screen you have two slightly smaller screens with a hinge in the middle uh, and you can take the screens off of the uh, off of the keyboard k at base and then like turn it to the side and like open it you know like a split screen um I just, it was just like really really good the concept of using two monitors when you are out and about working is something that has always frustrated me if i have to work out of the house and i'm using you know a 13 inch laptop or something I'm yeah like, oh God, i really miss my extra screen at this moment in time and this laptop just solves it by throwing in another 13 inch screen <laughs> I like the fact that you can um, flip the screens around into portrait mode. I think you say it won't, might not do too well in coffee shops, but I think that's the sort of thing writers like, isn't it? They like to have the portrait mode display option. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, being able to change it around is is what makes it such a good potential product in that you are not bound to it being like a vertically stacked dual screen system because if you go and look uh, listener this is the lenovo yoga book 9i when it is vertically stacked it looks a little bit unwieldy and you can only really imagine using that at home but once you rotate the screens as christian said you get two portrait mode screens side by side they clip back onto the keyboard and it just looks great and like using the keyboard at one of the showrooms as well like it's a really nice keyboard and as it's a lenovo product it comes with a handy pen as well they're touch screens so you can draw right on them or, or whatever it's, it's just it's a great all-round product okay so we've talked about quirky things we've talked about laptops and uh we talked a bit about urine uh <laughs> gavin <laughs> what <laughs> what um, do you think are the best new products in the electric vehicle area from CES 2023? Because this is um, this is something that a lot of people have attention on at the moment, is especially with the price of uh, fuel, um, uh, uh, liquid, gasoline, those sort of things. Um, a lot of people are thinking, uh, is my next vehicle going to be an electric vehicle? Yeah, so it was interesting for EVs because because it covers now such a wide area and such a huge area at ces um there were so many different products so whilst we were there volkswagen announced their new uh id7 uh electric car which looks really really nice uh sony and honda announced an entirely new uh ev brand called athena or i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that correctly but it looks like it that's a f double e l a athena uh, and, that, and their sort of concept car was basically a Sony entertainment hub on wheels. <laughs> and it looks absolutely bonkers. It's got like huge screens inside it, like uh, Sony sound system. So your audio will always sound absolutely bonkers good. Um, BMW announced its iVision D uh, car, which is another one that comes with a humongous internal screen. You can you can turn the seats around and like watch. I think it's like a thirty two inch screen inside it or something. But the outside of it also features like crazy different fusion colors as well. So that was quite interesting. But in terms of like outright announcements and stuff, there were interesting announcements from companies like Mercedes Benz, who although they're EVs are very expensive. You know, you're talking one hundred and fifty thousand dollars plus. They are working with um, ChargePoint, who are one of the biggest EV charging station 
um, outfits in the US and they're going to launch their own um, brand of EV charging points, I guess, across mm. the US. So they're going to they're investing billions to create their own sort of network. So that'd be an interesting to see how that works. Yeah, I was looking at that. I'm, uh, I mean, I'm one of these people who's a bit doubtful over infrastructure demands for uh, electric vehicles and something like that. I mean, that's quite good. But at the at the other side, you know, at the same time, it feels like something that Mercedes Benz shouldn't have to do. It seems to me like the things that um, governments and uh, infrastructure companies should be doing, and the, the fact that they're going to that extent, I, you know, is it really beyond the the, 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 the limits of possibility that Mercedes-Benz could soon be rolling out their own sort of uh, mini nuclear plants for these units as well. Well, for sure. Like, um, small-scale power production for EV stations is definitely a hot topic. People are looking more towards, I guess, solar and wind at the moment, but there will be definitely greater innovations. In well, I think they'll make more money from nuclear, to be honest with you. I think there's, there's more of a demand for... Uh, the power that nuclear provides compared to uh, solar and wind power. You know, that's something oh, they can yeah, sell without back to, doubt. The, to the networks, can't they? So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, it's, yeah, it's interesting the amount of uh, hype there is around the EV sector, especially what there was at uh, CES. Um, an interesting thing I saw in the EV thing was the uh, the autonomous IndyCar challenge. So, oh, they're right. basically a... They've taken um, Indy cars um, and instead of having a driver, they were entirely autonomous. And they, it was a competition for various university teams from cities around the world. Um, I believe the Italian university won it in the end. Um, yeah, I think it was the Italian university. But they basically took the these Indy cars out to a local track uh, the Las Vegas Speedway, and they were doing laps. So you would start off at, say, 50 miles an hour, and, and they would do a timed lap, two cars competing with each other. And then they would go up to 80, and then 120, and then 150, and so on. Uh, and what was interesting was that they were doing really, really well until the the very, very last... The very uh, One of the very last races where one of the cars... Uh, malfunctioned basically and they couldn't oh. figure out why and span out thankfully it didn't hit anything and cause loads of damage but they were like you could see the teams on the sidelines like scratching their heads as to why this autonomous uh, indie car had just suddenly span out span like three or four times mm. um, yeah so it was like an interesting proposition as we have you know Formula One and you know Formula electric which is all very interesting but it was like so these guys are looking at how to make racing completely autonomous and the question is like does that actually make it less exciting in some ways because the thrill is the driver being there um but as that aside the seeing them driving around a circuit you know at close to 200 kilometers an hour with no one inside the car was, was pretty cool yeah it would be just like watching a video game wouldn't it i don't know well, I thought it'd be better if they had like one of those giant, um, you know, controllers, <laughs> or like a huge Xbox controller with a giant aerial sticking out the top of it. Put a rabbit in it. <laughs> Poor rabbit. <laughs> yeah, but have have a rabbit in the driving seat, as it were, and then one of the rabbits wins, and of course, if one of the cars crashes, the rabbit dies. Oh my gosh! Well, <laughs> rabbits do for everyone, I guess. <laughs> Uh, apologies to any rabbits listening. Now, Gavin, is there anything that um, really stood out to you as we wrap up our CES podcast? Is it anything that stood out to you? You think that's the thing that's going to be the thing, or at least that's the thing I want to be buying? Uh, so one thing I tried, which I really liked, I don't know how well it would catch on, but it's something I would definitely consider buying for myself is um, the Razer Leviathan soundbar. Uh, and the technology for, from this soundbar comes from a company called Audio Scenic. Um, and you basically, it, it, it's a soundbar with head tracking built into it. So it has a small camera in the center of it. Center of it. 
uh, and it tracks your head movement. And instead of you having to wear headphones or have, you know, speakers all around your room, this soundbar can create a virtual 7.1 surround that um, actually works. Whoa. And I'm sure some of our listeners have used virtual surround sound before. And it, there are varying degrees of success. But this is the first one I've ever used and gone wow, that actually is making it sound like the sound's coming from, you know, whenever you move your head, the sound track perfectly because it has a camera built into it. And then you can actually get the sound coming from, you know, behind you with accuracy, which is really hard to do without the speaker range. Mm -hmm. And uh, and like above you as well, which again is really difficult to do without having a full range of speakers to project audio from, you know, from every angle. And so you sit in front of the uh, the Leviathan, uh, the Razer Leviathan. This is the first company that's licensed this technology from Audio Scenic. Um, and you sit in front of your computer and you move your head, no matter where you move it, because it has the camera tracking, it still manages to project full 7.1 surround all around you, um, very specific to your ears. Um, and not just that, though. I found, and the people that I tested it with, other people from Make Use Of, uh, we all said, despite it being a, a product that's focused on you sitting there and gaming or watching a film or what have you, it still sounds really good when you stand off to the side. So if you're not the one it being projected at, it still sounds like a very, very, very good uh, audio product in general. Now, the downside to these products is that it is a unique experience it's not like you and your partner could sit on the sofa and you would both experience it so at the current time it's very much sitting in front of your computer or what have you right right but the technology is going to evolve and eventually it will be you know dual tracking or multi-user tracking so that everybody can use it at the same time so i was really really impressed with that it was very very cool Well, that brings us to the end of this week's really useful podcast in which I hope we've managed to explain to you what CES is, the importance of CES and the sort of things that you see at CES and how they will eventually end up on the marketplace. Now, there, there are things that won't make it to marketplace. Uh, some things that Gavin's discussed maybe or some of the things in the lists that we'll link to in the show notes, uh, they might have looked great on the day, but they could be vaporware. So they may not, or they may just like fail at some advanced stage of development or pre-release. So they may not make it. But I don't know. I don't know if there's a percentage of things that actually make it to market. But um, you know, you can be pretty confident that if they don't make it, then ideas from them will end up in other products. Uh, as I mentioned, everything's in the show notes. Uh, there may be things that we miss. We'll do our utmost to get everything that we've discussed into the show notes for you to refer to and hopefully as i say that is a solved ces the mystery of ces for you uh, we'll be back with a new podcast next week until then it's goodbye from myself and gavin phillips bye-bye